The first settlement of Newbury, the first group of settlers arrived in 1635 in May. Within five years, they had started to really outgrow that first settlement location down by the Parker River. They moved the heart of the town and the meeting house uh, closer to what is now Newburyport, to what is now the border between Newbury and Newburyport. Uh, but they were still running out of room. There was a, a real crush of settlers in those first years, and land was really the currency. Uh, they, everybody was looking for land, trying to establish their families, and also trying to uh, get as much, of, as much land under private ownership as possible because it protected it from other communities encroaching on the grant. Uh, so by, 16, by the 1640s, within the, the first decade of settlement, land was being granted uh, particularly on the, like around the artichoke to some of Newbury's uh, first settler families, uh, the Emery's, the Rawson family, some names that we still really know and identify with, with West Newbury and that area. Um, and actually, as early as 1660, a very large piece of land on the Groveland, what's now the Groveland Line, was granted. Now, you couldn't possibly be further away from the meeting house than that. You're all the way down uh, by Crane Neck Street, and that was granted to uh, Captain Garish, uh, and then all the land between Garish and, you know, sort of the Emery lot, which is more or less, you know, where the All Saints Church is now, um, was, fi was actually divided up in 1686. So it didn't even take 50 years for this idea that everyone's going to have this community clustered around the meeting house. It didn't take very long to turn it into a very large, spread out, uh, area with people living all the way to what is now the Groveland Line. The lots were divided up on what is the Merrimack River side of the of Main Street now in West Newbury First. But again, people just kept having kids and spreading out and establishing homesteads. My family, you know, the the poor family, uh, started out in Newbury, made its way over to sort of Byfield Indian Hill area, and by the time this house was built uh, in 1800, had moved down Garden Street and up the hill. So uh, this was a part of West Newbury that was populated really by the 1740s, only a generation or two from a time when you weren't even really supposed to be settling in West Newbury at all. So people that lived in West Newbury also have had a little bit of a, I think an extra independent streak. So the first landing was off of the Parker River. So what we know is that the first group sort of, you know, came up from Ipswich, got off their boat, and uh, their first priority was to uh, reinforce their bonds as a congregation. They all gathered together under a big oak tree. This is the, under a spreading tree, this is sort of story that's been passed down. And they all made their pledges to each other of how they would be um, as a community, as a religious community. And one of the problems with uh, saying your bit under a big oak tree is that nobody wrote it down. So later on in the long 17th century, the people of Newbury began to disagree on exactly what they had promised to each other under that tree. Uh, and the beginning of the very contentious uh, sort of religious based, although they really were, sometimes issues of doctrine really drove parishes apart. More often it was the very practical issues of having to be in the meeting house several times during the week. I mean, you had to be, it wasn't optional to skip it. And if you were settled in what is now West Newbury, you know, hoofing it to the first parish meeting house really was an incredible, it was a half a day's walk if you were there going there with your family. Uh, and you might have to go there two or three times a week for town business. So the establishment of various parishes and churches really was more about practical matters, uh, than religious ones, although certainly religious conflicts were rampant. So when Newbury people who had settled around what they called the Plains, which is approximately where the Port Plaza and Belleville Cemetery is now, uh, down to Maudsley Estate, they petitioned for a uh, to become a second parish beginning in, uh, in 1689. Uh, and the town said no uh, repeatedly. The, these people, the second parish folks, uh, petitioned again. And finally, after a lot of very contentious back and forth, uh, the second parish was granted in 1695. So you would think that that would be the end of the story. Here's second parish established uh, near where, is, where the Sawyer Hill burying ground is now. But that was not to be the case. Uh, the, as a compromise location, 
uh, Sawyer Hill had been determined to serve its population well, but it did not adequately serve the population that was living in what is now West Newberry. So when the second parish was established, it was agreed on that the, uh, the meeting house would be moved to Pipestave Hill after the Sawyer Hill meeting house uh, was no longer uh, usable for its congregation for a variety of reasons. So by 1709, the parish had determined that the Sawyer Hill meeting house was no longer suitable for their purposes, and they had decided to move the parish center to Pipestave Hill in West Newbury, as agreed on by the parish uh, when it had been established. And unfortunately, the Sawyer Hill congregation said, no, we're going to repair the meeting house and stay where we are. The process was so incredibly contentious that by 1711, a group, uh, the majority of the parishioners wanted the move to Pipestave Hill, and a group of these parishioners voted and then agreed to tear down the Sawyer Hill meeting house. The Sawyer Hill people said they would guard it with their very lives. The Pipestave Hill people came down during the night and tore down the Sawyer Hill meeting house. It was a terrible blow to the Sawyer Hill congregation. And in fact, it caused an incredible development in the history of Newbury, which is that the Sawyer Hill population, who was ordered to, by the general court, not to use the, the remnants of the meeting house that they had begun to rebuild, uh, they decided to go Anglican. They went back to the Church of England, which, you know, less than a century since their, uh, you know, fathers and uncles had come over from England uh, to practice their own, to leave the Church of England. They went back to the Church of England and are the, were the nucleus of establishing uh, the Anglican and then Episcopal Church in Newbury. They became St. Paul's Church. And of course, there's now an Episcopal Church um, in West Newbury as well, All Saints Episcopal Church, which was formed much later, but from that same core body of people who rejected the, the, the decision about Sawyer Hill. It really was a practical decision that turned into a monumentous religious one uh, and had its own consequences for that congregation. The process of walking to the meeting house was, you can't underestimate how, how onerous that was for people. If you lived three or four miles away from the meeting house, or in the case of moving from Sawyer Hill to Pipestave Hill, you were looking at an additional you know, three, four mile uh, commute round trip for sure. It was a big deal to have to uproot your whole family and go to the meeting house. Not attending the meeting house really wasn't an option. Uh, and there are other reasons to believe that the Sawyer Hill group, which was so bitter and angry, really didn't want to be Anglicans. They hired a minister who wrote a plaintive series of letters to the Church of England in England saying, they won't let me wear my robes, they won't take communion properly, <laughs> they, don't want any, they don't want any of the things that come along with being Anglican, they just don't want to walk to church. The Puritan system was the system that was established. We think about it now as congregationalism. The idea that all full members of the church, which of course were men, landowning, freeholding men, um, but they all had an equal voice. And this is an incredible radical concept. You know, they have an equal voice in church. And of course, the meeting house was also the secular authority. And it is a kind of an incredible beginning of the idea of direct participatory democracy that we still see in things like town meetings. You get to see it in New Hampshire if you've ever been up there during a presidential campaign. Uh, the idea that every person uh, has a right and a responsibility to an equal voice in the, the governing of their, in this case, their town. Puritanism was dedicated to the idea that it was not necessary to have a uh, strict authority structure. Uh, and it's funny because we think of Puritans as very authoritarian. And they were in their way, but also they never, it's not to be confused with the idea of personal independence. If anything, the Puritan ideal was that the community of believers was of the utmost importance. Uh, the individual was less important, although the individual's relationship with God and with the Bible could be unmediated by a priest. So People uh, learned to read, they learned to write, including women. The Puritan ideal was that, again, this is a city on the hill, this is a godly city where uh, people in the community are going to live together according to pure Christian principles. I have a particular love for West Newbury because I think it, in many ways, is closer in terms of population and generally, you know, in people's relationships to each other as these early communities.
it's hard to imagine Newberry, early Newberry, because it's so large and incorporates such a large area as being really a small town that probably behaved more like West Newberry does today. You know, with people participating directly in town meetings and taking a real stake in their community. It's, it's a, a wonderful thing to see that still happening, as exhausting and contentious as it can be. It's, it's wonderful that that survives, and it is a direct legacy of the early settlers of Newberry.